All right, and we're live. It's been brought to my attention that reading someone's bio from a book is not the most engaging. On the flip side of that, I don't have time to memorize all of this information and practice it for 40 hours, which is really what it deserves. So I'm going to attempt to use the oldest trick in the newscaster's book, the teleprompter, like Ron Burgundy. We are classy. Bear with me. I'll get better at this. We'll see how this works out. The point is the content. So here we go. With the threat of rent controls and other government interference in the California rental housing industry, on this episode of Rental Owner Insight, I'm grateful to spend time with Alan Pentico, Executive Director of the Southern California Rental Housing Association, formerly known as the San Diego County Apartment Association. As the Executive Director, Alan draws on extensive community and advocacy experience in the rental housing and real estate industries, coupled with previous campaign strategy and political advisory work with elected officials. Alan joined the association in the summer of 2003, after six years as a senior policy advisor in the office of San Diego County Supervisor Diane Jacob. On Jacob's staff, he was responsible for policy development in the areas of housing and community development, public health, social services, children's services, and drug and alcohol services. As Supervisor Jacobs liaison to the county's Housing and Community Development Department, Allen took on the challenges associated with revitalizing several distressed communities. Before joining Supervisor Jacobs' staff, Allen briefly worked in Sacramento for Governor Pete Wilson in the Office of Planning and Research, where he assisted with analyzing legislation. In addition, Allen has done work on several campaigns as paid and volunteer staff, as well as consulting. A San Diego native, Alan holds a Bachelor of Arts in Political Science from the University of San Diego. He and his wife, Heather, a school teacher in my community of El Cajon, are residents of San Carlos, a community of the city of San Diego. To further his career in the nonprofit trade industry, Alan sought and received his Certified Association Executive, CAE, designation from the American Society of Association Executives. You know, Alan certainly has the credentials to and experience to guide our industry through these turbulent legislative waters. Uh, after reading all of those credentials, which many of you may not have known about, uh, I'm confident uh, and just watching him firsthand that Alan can help us uh, with not only what we're dealing with on the ground here in San Diego County, but also at the statewide level. So here we go my interview with Alan Pentico. This is Rental Owner Insight, ROI, with Doug Tabor, CCIM. Hope you enjoy it. By the way, in case I forget, subscribe down below and you'll get constant updates for new episodes. Take care. All right, perfect. Alan, how's it going? Good, how are you doing, Doug? Uh, you know, I'm doing good. I mean, I'm doing as good as we can be here in San Diego. We've got beautiful weather. Uh, we're in a thriving economy. There's a lot of talk out there about things changing. Uh, but, of course, the elephant in the room is some of the legislative changes that seem to be the topic of everybody's conversation. Yeah, it's, uh, the big one is rent control, and it just doesn't seem to go away. We, uh, we defeated it, Proposition 10, at the ballot last year. The industry spent $80 million defeating that statewide initiative to repeal cost to Hawkins which is a component of rent control. And here locally in San Diego uh, County, we defeated uh, Measure W, which was the National City Rent Control, and we spent another $700,000 defeating that initiative. Uh, and and hope, we thought put writing, we thought about it, we put rent control to bed. Popped up this year, beginning of the year, the legislature right off the bat brought these issues right back up. And uh, right now it's been whittled down to, uh, out of I think eight bills total, it all comes down to AB 1482, a CHU bill. Um, that's labeled as anti-price gouging um, legislation uh, during this housing crisis, following Penal Code 396, where you emergency disasters, wildfires, floods, those sort of things. They put the Penal Code in place and it keeps uh, people from, from gouging. This is following, uh, supposedly following that model, but 
in all reality, it's rent control. It's statewide rent control. I had the great fortune last year of being on the committee with you that, or the campaign that, that was that was fighting for the rights of the rental uh, owners and the landlords in town, uh, both at the Measure W and at the statewide level, Prop 10. It was the first time I'd ever been involved in a political <laughs> action committee like that. It was really exciting just being a part of it. And then the fact that we won by a very small measure on Measure W, what, like 160 votes? Uh, we, won, it was a, we won by 155 votes, but really we won and we added 154 for good measure. You, only, you win by one vote. 154 votes. Is that why it took so long to get the count at the at the end of it? It seemed like yes. the final count was yeah. taking weeks. It was. There were some issues with the registrar and the processes and things like that uh, in the count process and with new rules with regard to the ballots and how they're counted and when you can cast a ballot. Um, so more ballots were counted in this scenario. Um, so as ballots came in even six, seven days later, they still get counted. Um, it's no longer what you have on hand at eight o'clock plus what they're delivering kind of thing. Um, so more and more ballots were counted that were, what they call were held back. Mm -hmm. So where people t got their write-in ballots, filled them out, held them back to the last minute, showed up at the registrar and dropped them in the box um, and that sort of thing. So that delayed the count quite a bit. And, um, and then also the verification of, uh, of them. There's always a, a testing process as you go through to verify that everything's copacetic, signatures are valid and those sort of things. So we, out of 11,500 votes, I think was what, roughly, uh, 150 votes dodged the bullet. So we won on that measure, which was exciting. And then Prop 10 was like 60-40 uh, opposed to Prop more 10. More than 60-40 opposed Was it more? 10, yeah. So it was a huge number. Yeah. So you would think that was the, the voters have spoken. Right. And the legislature said, no, they didn't, and started all over again when the legislation opened in January. So right that, out of the bat. Multi we had, I think... I guess it's six or seven different bills that came out of it. So that's where I, I'm stunned because I'm not really a political guy. Fortunately, our association has you, someone like you that has the experience on the political Thank side you. in charge as the executive director. Um, and I really saw you in action with your team in this very room, kind of like the <laughs> war room. It was. <laughs> fighting for everybody's rights. And I mean, it was I felt like I was just kind of the, you know, the wallflower in there. I didn't have a lot to contribute, but I did learn a lot. And then to turn around and the very first legislative session, the legislators out of, well, there's, there's as you remember, as you mentioned, there's Assembly Member Chu out of San Francisco who immediately put forth AB 1482. And then I believe Bloom also out of Santa Monica, two very heavily rent controlled cities. Yep. Uh, put forth another measure, but that didn't get, get wheels, so to speak. Yeah. But AB 1482 is moving on, and it sounds like it's, uh, it, it has a it lot behind it. It passed out of the Assembly, so it moved okay. over to the Senate. It's been working its way through the Senate. There's been literally negotiations going on daily at every level in every office you can imagine. Wow. Our team was in the governor's office again recently, um, having discussions with them. Um, it's going to be uh, continually debated and negotiated all the way up to the very end. Um, there's a lot of key points that are in, in movement. One of the things that happened when it got to the Senate side is in the Assembly side, there was a corresponding cause eviction bill that was handedly defeated in the Assembly. But when, this, when 1482 made it over to the Senate, uh, the author reinserted the language that was in the cause eviction bill into 1482. So now we have these two bills merged into one. Um, in the, on the Senate side. So you have the price gouging rules and then the cause eviction rules that they're proposing. And um, there's multiple components to this. Um, and what they're really sorting out uh, right now is how would these components, how do they interlace with the existing rent control rules and the current juris the one, the juris jurisdictions that already have rent control, mm -hmm. as well as the in interplay and impacts on Costa Hawkins. Um, they're trying, my understanding is that they're trying not to do damage to what they already have, not to weaken from their perspective, from the legislator's perspective, not to weaken their existing rent control laws or co at this, and at the same time not to uh, eliminate the protections of cost to Hawkins. Hmm. But so how do we play it out? So what 1482 will do in a simple form is if you have rent control, say in Santa Monica right now, and Costa Hawkins has the protections, 
uh, the statewide bill that if 1480 should pass will will cover all the other jurisdictions that do not right. currently have rent control. Um, and um, so there'll be some protections that are different in those current jurisdictions versus the state portion. Got it. Um, and then and on top of that, what is the interplay with jurisdictions adopting new rent control laws after this goes into effect because this will not prevent them from doing that. It's not a stop, it's not a basically preemption from everybody else. A local jurisdiction still can through and come up with their own more stringent form of rent control or more restrictive form of increases. So it doesn't mean that this is a one size covers the state, now it's in place, now the local jurisdictions need to back off. This is really just a, a coverall, and then at the local level, they take precedence over. Well, th that's an interesting thing, because um, what people, you know, everyone makes, everyone, I think, assumes this is emergency legislation, because we're in an, an emergency crisis on housing right now. It's not, it's just legislation. Right. Um, if it were, it would have different impacts. There's certain things, you may recall the Northridge earthquakes, when the um, freeways collapsed in Los Angeles, right. the governor declared a state of emergency, which allowed him to bypass a whole bunch of rules and requirements and immediately get villages rebuilt in three months. Right. He could put those things aside. That's not what this is. This is just standard legislation, although it's sort of being played out as it is emergency. We're in a crisis, it is emergency, but it's not. So um, those existing rules will be able to stay in play. The, if should this pass, these new rules will come into play. So you, you have to do the algebra, uh, call it the rent control algebra to figure out what's going to be what. And then should a jurisdiction, a local jurisdiction, then adopt rent control or they don't, that adds another layer to it. And to add more complications to it, um, we know that uh, Mr. Weinstein that pushed for Prop 10 last year is out gathering signatures again, or I think we qualified his, his signature gathering already for a ballot initiative next year, which would make some of these changes permanent, which would then add another layer uh, next fall of rent control algebra. So it will be a real mess to sort through and nothing will be similar in any jurisdiction. I'm smiling because I the, the words uh, gum on the shoe come to mind with Mr. Weinstein out of Los Angeles. He mentioned when he lost Prop 10 last year that mm -hmm. he was like a piece of gum that once he gets on the shoe, he never gives up. So help us understand like what does AB 1482 maybe just the, it's going to change right I mean it's already it's changed, changing both, yeah it's changing probably even daily but what are the main points that, that sure the, I think the key point know. that goes to the price gouging aspect of is it you will allow it to be due at this point and I say at this point because literally it changes every day right at this point you're allowed to do one rent increase per year and it'll be equate to CPI plus seven percent Okay. Um, that's the first component. Now that seven percent is being negotiated. Some other, some people want it as little as five. Others have said two, um, mm -hmm. but right now it seems like it's what's sticking is CPI plus seven percent. But at the same time, it has to be less than ten percent total. Okay. So that's another caveat to it. So there'll be no rent increases more than ten percent. So ten percent max. Max. Okay. Yep. In a twelve month period. In a twelve month period. In a twelve month period. So the other component to it is it has a rollback, if you will, saying if you've uh, raised your rents between March 15th of this year and the time this passes, um, and they're more than 10%, what the legislature is included in the language is uh, you, can, you will have to roll it back to no more than 10%, but they're giving forgiveness and you're not gonna have to return the difference. Mm. Um, but you will have to roll it back to less than 10, to, to the 10, no more than 10%. So it's, it's done. So if you haven't raised your rent in a long time. Oh yeah. If you didn't raise them before March, uh, March 15th, uh, yeah, you're, wow. going, you're, you're, that's the thing a lot of people don't understand is that it's already happened. It's already happened. It's already happened. Yeah. yeah. Um, so those are the two big things um, that has it. This is this price gouging component of it is supposed to expire on January 1st of 2023. Because again, this is supposedly an emergency measure to, um, to stem the tide while they figure out how to get more housing built. So um, some people have said that that should be longer. It should, uh, it should go until 2030. Um, but I think the legislature at this point really thinks it should be 2023, four years, that gets through a legislative, uh, legislative slash elective cycle, if you will, but doesn't put it off so long that um, it turns people off to the idea. Again, it's supposed to solve a, a crisis point hmm. right now. So they still think that uh, this is going to fix a problem that 
that was created by lack of housing it, and by... I think what they think right now is that this will keep people in their housing. In their housing, okay. In their housing. Now, the reason you're calling it rent gouging is because they're tying it into the governor's wildfire emergency bill. That's that what they're modeling it after. It's actually considered rent gouging legislation, which is interestingly enough, when it, to the, when it went to the Senate side, it was supposed to go to the housing committee, and it didn't because it's price gouging rules that went to the judiciary. Hmm. And that's one of the key things is because of it's being called price gouging rules, it allowed it to go to judiciary, not the housing committee. Is the governor's emergency bill in place currently, the one that he... Penal uh, Code 396. I believe it's still in play now. Um, that's the thing is anytime they have a state of emergency, a wildfire flood, it's in place for about six to 18 months or something like that. Right. And it seems like we have them more frequently than that. So it's literally been in place for about three years ongoing now. Got it. It used to be, it used to be sort of interpreted that it was, um, it only impacted the counties where the emergency was. But a couple of years ago, the attorney general sort of rewrote that and said no, because uh, I think with the Napa fires, um, the majority of the housing in, in the Napa area burnt down. So when people went to find housing in other counties, it impacted multiple other counties, which is why they sort of reinterpreted it to mean that it would impact everybody in the state. Got it. And we know that, you know, you can sort of see and understand that because with the Paradise fires, I know people that lived in Paradise that now live in um, Palm Springs. I mean, they rescattered everywhere because they lost so many housing units. Wow. Yeah. <clears throat> one of the other components to it is um, it it's only impacts as it stands right now, and this is one of the negotiating points again, is it will only impact uh, housing that has a, cer a certificate of occupancy that's less than 15 years. Okay. Some people have said, asked for it to be five. Some people have said seven. Some people have had said 20. Um, that's one of those cause to hawken sort of rules that said nothing, bef nothing after 1995 would have rent control. The reason they have that 15 years is because they don't want to discourage new development. They figure if you build a new property, um, that 15 years would give you 15 years of market rate before they, they slide you into these price controls, um, which is you know, one of those aspects. So it'll be anybody's guess what it looks like once it gets through the Senate as well. Yep. Interesting. Yeah. And then, and then after Senate, you have to go back to, um, I think it's called a reconciliation, where the two houses have to come together and agree that this is what the final product will look like. And only at that point will it go to the governor for signature. But the governor has already signaled that he, there are some things that he wants to see in it, but he will likely sign it. Um, I think he said that a couple of weeks ago when he was here in town. Yeah, he said it a couple times, I believe. Yep. He was actually saying that he wished it had uh, greater impact. Yes, yeah that it was a tougher bill. With regards to the just cause eviction, how does that piece play out in it as it's currently written now? Of course, it could right. change. But um, the just cause eviction is, is added to it, or cause eviction is really what it is. Okay. Um, so after 12 months of occupancy, then you will have, um, you'll have to give cause for eviction. If you have a curable eviction, meaning a violation of a lease, um, uh, committed a crime on the property, um, failure to pay rent, failure to follow the rules of, the, of the, your contract, whatever. Those are all curable. There's nine curable offenses. You give correct or quits, and that's the, that's the nine curable. There's four non-curable, which means there's four reasons you can evict somebody under the, ch under the cause of eviction. Um, I'm moving back into the unit myself. Um, the unit has significant damage to uh, major components that I need to remove everybody from it to do these repairs, and they're not cosmetic repairs, they're structural repairs and things like that. There's four of those. The trick with the, the non-curable or no-fault components is that if you give a no-fault eviction, um, you have to pay them one month's rent. And then there sets forth some pretty strict guidelines as to how that process works. And if you miss any of those deadlines or any one of those steps, it automatically um, cancels out the eviction and you have to start over. So if you're in this business, you know that not every tenant is an angel. No. Yeah. And uh, that's just life. That's every industry, every occupancy. Absolutely. Uh, every occupation, you name it. Right. There's, there's always one bad actor. There, absolutely. Yeah. And I guess my, my question is, so if you have someone that's 
breaking the rules, but in a sense that they're not necessarily breaking something that's written into the lease. And we all know, I mean, there could be noise, there could mm -hmm. be uh, folks might not want to report that individual because that's they're the number scared, one complaint. That's that they're the, scared. That, that's the number one complaint with these ordinances. We've had cause eviction here in San Diego since I think 2004, I think is when we passed ours. I just came to the association at that time. And it, it's one of those things that if you have someone that's being noisy or threatening a neighbor, um, the only way in California that you can go to court and get them evicted is you have to have witnesses. They do not take written testimony. You have to have a witness. So if your kids are intimidating my kids, I have to go to court and testify against you, knowing that you know what my kids look like, you know what time they come home from school, you know what kind of car I drive, you know when I come home from school, who's gonna put themselves in that position? It has a chilling effect on that. So it makes it extremely difficult for the property managers and supervisors to, um, to sort of um, mediate those situations. Yeah. It's extremely difficult. And they're common. I, I'm, when I got out of the military and I was living in an apartment, I remember there was a guy named George that was there. And he and I kind of became friends and then I realized he was kind of a bad apple and I started distancing. I mean, you know, when someone comes up to you, you move in someplace new, you know, you talk to neighbors and you yeah. want to be at least friendly. George started kind of stalking and hovering around uh, my apartment and I called the cops a couple times because he was kind of a drinker mm -hmm. and they came and they said there was nothing that they could do. Yeah. And I even tried to complain to the managers and they said that there was nothing they could do and yeah. you know I'm former marine I mean if there's something that I if I felt intimidated by a guy who was just drunk outside my patio every day imagine what you know someone that is there with their kids yeah um, sometimes you just you have challenges so this would it would make it difficult to get rid of the Georges of the world it would de definitely make it uh, much much more difficult um, which, you know, and the, the thing you always fear in our industry because we hear it so many, so many times is that um, that situation that went too far. And, you know, you were doing your best to, to grab that opportunity when it came up, but when it came up, it was the worst thing. Yeah. Um, and that's what you kind of, that you, that's what you fear. And, I, you know, I've, I've had people tell me, elected officials tell me that, oh, well, you know, after, after you know, how long does it take you to get to know somebody? Um, six months, 12 months, 24 months, you know, what is it? You should know what you should know by that. The thing is, you know, life has its moments sure, and it changes people. And so you could be the perfect model tenant for two years and then suddenly someone's life falls apart and um, things change. And they're stock and tenants. And, there's, and, and it makes it, and in that scenario, what do you do? Well, they'll say that it doesn't happen all that often. It happens. It and, happens. And it only takes that one incident that uh, everyone regrets and, and um, what's what we try to avoid. Um, th so yeah, it's a scary thing. It really is for property managers especially because you know in our industry, if you're the, the manager of a community, you're the mayor of the community. You take right. personal, most managers that I know, um, like again, 99.999%, I would say, um, take pride in their community and what they do and they're trying to make it a good, pleasant place to live and um, they do their best to walk those lines, so. And are evictions really a problem? There's a website called Eviction Lab, yeah. uh, and there's a list that says yeah. the, city, the top cities of evictions. Barely any of them were in, per, by a per capita or percentage rate, were in California. Comparatively to the other states, no. Comparatively to the other states, yeah. and it was. Well, you think about it this way, for California, I mean, and then people ask me this, I'm like, well, yeah, the legislature started defunding courts two decades ago. I mean, when I came to the association 16 years ago, I think we had three courts in, in throughout different regions of the county that were processing evictions. For a county that's, I think, 6,000 square miles, we're down to one court that processes evictions downtown. Wow. And I think there's one or maybe two judges that handle them, and that's it for the entire county of this size. And, you know, you have to stop and wonder, was this done intentionally to slow the eviction process, um, to, keep people within the, to keep people in their housing, um, we both know. I mean, I've never met a landlord that evicts somebody just because they want to evict them. It's not fun. It's extremely expensive to turn over a yeah. unit. The marketing costs and the downtime is not worth it, particularly for small owners. And that's what California is. 67% right. of ownership of rental properties in California is a person like yourself or your mom and dad or an aunt and uncle or a grandparent. 
um, that bought property as an investment. They have 15 or less units. That's 67, like 67 wow. percent. There's very few big corporate owners. It's that just California didn't develop on that timeline. Um, the, the timeline we developed on, that's who invested in, in rentals. And, and um, so if you have a fourplex and you do an eviction, you have 25% loss of revenue. If you have a, two, a duplex, that's 50% loss. You can't survive long and not get rent and pay your mortgage if you evict people. Um, so it's, it's one of those things. Yeah, people do get evicted. Um, um, and I don't think it's this extreme crisis that it is in other places here in California. It's, it's interesting because, you know, as a broker, I sell apartment buildings and, yeah. and rental properties in San Diego. So all day long, I talk to independent owners yeah. and uh, a lot of them that make up this association. And they're not the fat cat landlords that you hear about on the media. You're yeah. exactly right. Most of them are retired school teachers, uh, retired painters or plumbers, people that just want to supplement their income. They want to have... Uh, some retirement yeah. and they work and work and work and they deal with what we call in our workshops the terrible teas, tenants, toilets, trash, termites, mm -hmm. all of these items that we were talking, the Georges, I mean all these problems, they, they take all of this on mm -hmm. for years, decades and when they finally feel like they're getting to get ahead, uh, they, government interference starts coming in and really affects them. Section 8 was one of them. You yeah. know, it's not that they didn't want Section 8 tenants. They didn't want Section 8 paperwork because they're independent well, owners. It was, yeah, it wasn't the Section 8. It wasn't the Section 8 tenants at all. It wasn't even our local housing authorities that were putting the programs. We're fortunate in San Diego that the major housing authorities do really, really good programs. Yeah. They'll even tell you it's the government bureaucracy part of it that's right. the nightmare. Right. And um, we lobby every year since I've been with the association. We're in D.C. lobbying on getting that fixed. It's the government federal government's program at that level that makes it just ridiculously hard. Difficult. Most people I know, I, I've talked to owners that support it, um, that rely on it in down economies because it's a check from the government you know you're going to get. And I have know people that rely on it in the good economies because it's the, that's what they like to do and what's important, particularly mm -hmm. here in, um, in, in San Diego. Um, I, I would say that, um, y you know, our members and the industry itself are very sympathetic to our, our to their customers, yeah. to renters and to, to tenants, um, because they're small owners. They're not big corporations. Even the big corporations, I mean, I've, I've, I've worked with them. I've, I've seen their trainers. I've talked to them. They care very deeply about their uh, their clientele. Um, it's like I said, it's only a few bad apples that you know that really make things bad. Um, but I mean, I, I talked to one of our members that. Um, um, she explained it to me last year when we were doing the rent control uh, discussions. And she said, look, I've had this property. I'm retired. It's a six-unit property. I live in one unit. The other five units, every tenant's been there longer than 20 years. And she told me how far behind she is on her rent increases. And I will tell you she's two-thirds behind. And she said, well, look at it. you have to look at it and understand it this way. I had a plan for retirement. And um, I knew how much I needed to make to make the mortgage work and uh, to supplement my income, but I didn't want to have such, uh, I didn't want to have such a high income off the rentals that it forced me into, into a higher tax bracket, mm -hmm. which would shorten my retirement pay. Mm -hmm. Because she had it, she goes, I'm going to have to live 30 feet, 30 years in retirement, is what she was estimating, something like that. And if she went into another tax bracket, those years shortened. So she was going to run out of money in retirement because, so she kept her rents purposely low. She goes, but if rent control comes in, how am I going to deal with the emergencies for roof repairs and things like that? I'm going to have to raise the rents, which is going to trigger all those things. People don't understand that, you know, there's a whole retirement mathematical plan. You do under, you understand it much better than I do um, that goes into this. It's not like I'm just going to buy a rental and start charging rents and, and I'm pay a little bit of money towards my mortgage and I'm making all this money on the side. It's not the case at all. It's not the it's case. It's not. Yeah. It's not. And those are the ones that are going to get affected very no, heavily because well, literally we were in the car talking to one of my clients uh, and we're doing a valuation for her and she's 30% off in her rents from low market. I mean yeah. conservative market. Yeah. Way under $900 for two bedrooms in, yeah. in, in a good part of the county. And I was talking to her. And when you think about it, if she's at 
let's just say $800 for a two bedroom, for her to get caught up at 10% a year, that's $80 annually. To get caught up, it's gonna take five, six, seven, eight years. The challenge is a lot of these folks that bought these back in the 70s and 80s, the school, she literally, I don't want to say her profession because I don't want anybody, she literally <laughs> worked for a educational group, let's just put it that way. And it, it was a government and she was uh, buying this property to supplement her retirement and she's on CalPERS, so she's an employee of the state. Uh, she bought this property many, many, many years ago at a great price. But the, the part that you don't think about is the appreciation, you know, and to turn around and try to sell this property now, she's not going to be able to sell it for anywhere close to what the market should bear because the income's not there. And so it, it could cause her to either have to take a huge cut in, in her value of her property or to have to wait another five or six years. Well, she's got a situation where she may not have the ability to wait that long. And those are the people uh, which make up a lot of the independent owners that you were talking about that are the everyday stories that are really going to get impacted by yeah. this. And we're already seeing it, you know, with the association just, um, you know, we saw it last year uh, when National City, within 30 days of the announcement of the uh, ballot initiative, I think sales for rentals went up 80 percent, went up 80 yeah. percent in one month in National City. Mm -hmm. And uh, every week uh, we talk, we share stories in our team meetings every week. If an owner called them and says, I've sold my property, I'm packing up, I'm moving out of state, I'm done with this. Right. And so that basically with the bulk of the ownership in, with in, in independent owner hands, they're selling this property off. Well, they're not going to renters. They're being sold as single family homes and uh, condominiums that are being sold off in a lot of cases to people who are gonna own it. So you're seeing the rental market, uh, you're going to see the rental market shrink. Yep. The number of units overall will come down. Then you add in the idea of uh, some of these restrictions um, that will dissuade developers from building. And we need more building, not less building. And if, if a developer comes in and says, I can't pencil it out and make it work within, in this case, 15 years, I'm not gonna make enough money back to do it, you've lost a segment of that pool that's gonna do it. And it's right. already tough enough with the land costs and the, the, you know, we, the, the high land costs and the fact that we're paying 40% of a development into regulation, into fees and regulations, um, it's already hard enough. And then you have these other restrictions and you're taking the pull and you're over shrinking it. So um, I think it'll make, it, immediately it's gonna make the housing crisis probably worse. So Alan, you've been executive director in the association since when? 2012. 2012, you came in 2004 though? You started I came to the association, association in 2003 and I was a lobbyist for eight years. So you were a lobbyist for eight years, so it was your job, your profession to know what was going on yep. and to, uh, to be able to communicate with what's going on with the politicians. Uh, was that both locally and at the Sacramento level? Yeah, so um, at that time, uh, we were the San Diego County Apartment Association, right. and at that, so we, our jurisdiction was San Diego and Imperial County. So I lobbied on all the jurisdictions here. So 18 cities in the county itself in San Diego, Imperial, uh, which would, not too much was going on out there. Um, and then um, I supported and backed up our state effort and our national effort as well. And um, uh, 2011, um, we broke away. Um, we went off on our own with a uh, coalition of other rental, uh, rental associations in the state. There's a coalition now of 10 of them called the California Rental Housing Association, okay. uh, where we have a large network in California that's part of the National Apartment Association. When we moved into that uh, segment, um, we also moved up into Southern Riverside County. So we have Temecula, Marietta, all the way to Palm Springs, actually all the way out to Arizona, pretty much almost all the way to Arizona. So um, when we did that, um, the, um, that was 2011 or 12, um, we started paying more attention. We tried to make inroads into, into those areas, um, strengthen our numbers, provide services because they weren't getting any at that time. Mm -hmm. And the common came, thing that came back is, we'd be out in Palm Springs saying, what is the San Diego County Apartment Association doing in Palm Springs? Right. We're in Riverside County, what do you, we, you know? Um, well, we're, we're your local association, you're, we're your regional uh, trade association for the rental housing industry. So it didn't, the name doesn't res didn't resonate. And we'd already known for a long time. I think we've had the, the San Diego County Apartment Association moniker since the early 90s. And before that, it was the San Diego Apartment Association. And it's had like nine iterations over the last hundred years. 
So based on all that, the board did a, uh, a market research program last year. We did a bunch of focus groups. And um, one of the things that came out is we need a name that's more reflective of all the territories we represent, Imperial, San Diego, and Riverside County, but all of our membership types as well. We weren't just apartments. Right. Uh, a lot of our owners, are they own single family homes and condos and duplexes and fourplexes. And a large segment of our membership is the people who supply services to the industry. The carpet layers, the pool cleaners, the gardeners, the roofers, the painters, um, asphalt mailboxes, you name it. Anything that goes into a repair or maintenance or service to a rental property, uh, they're part of our membership as well. Hence, so the new name, Southern California Rental Housing Association. Yeah, so that's so the new brand came out when January. January of two thousand nineteen. Yep. Southern, so it, it's 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 a lead up to our one hundredth birthday, which is on September sixteenth. That's right. That's yeah. right around the corner. Right around the corner. So Southern California Rental Housing Association. Now you you essentially that includes San Diego County, Imperial County, Riverside County. Half a southern half of Riverside County. Southern half of Riverside yeah. County. All right. Yeah. We have uh, we we so we lobby. We track and lobby all the jurisdictions locally, the cities and the counties themselves. We have our own lobbyists in Sacramento uh, that we have uh, engaged, so we're very actively engaged in all these discussions going on, both as a coalition partner with the California Rental Housing Association, but also as our own regional organization. And then we also back up and support the National Apartment Association in DC. So that's what I was gonna lead up to on a question is, is You've, you've kind of observed both how they operate at the state level, how they operate at the local level, through the association, all the years that you've had. Why is it that it seems like they make it so challenging to build additional units? Because I know the stance of the association during the last campaign was, look, we need, we need supply and demand. We need, need more housing. The whole state, it's yeah. obvious, everybody, it's obvious as nose on my face that everybody keeps saying, we need more housing, but well, yet it's. I think it's a. It's a. I think it's just a stigma of home ownership in general. Um, I buy a single. I, I, you know, single-family homes, home tracks came onto the market after World War II. Um, that model, where you had track homes and suburban on, uh, atmosphere and that whole thing, came into play. And what people, hey, that's what I want. I'm buying that image. I'm going to move in, and that's what I want. And I want that forever. Um, but forever didn't account for having kids and having grandkids. And I think a lot of people think that, um, well, it's all these people moving here. When, and, and all honestly, it's not. We have, a, um, we're pretty much neutral, if not net negative, on people moving to California. The true growth is coming from internal. It's birth rates. Mm -hmm. And we've never kept pace with it. I remember one of my first assignments when I came to the association is we had a 10 or 15 year old white paper on the, the housing situation and what we needed to do. And um, I, I was told to update it. So I pulled out, I started doing some research and I literally went, yeah, everything it said to do, we still need to do, but now even more so because we're 10 more or 15 more years behind what it said initially. And I think we updated it one time since then, then we quit updating it because it just, again, impounded and compounded and compounded and compounded. We don't build enough housing to, to provide housing for our own kids. Um, I think there was a Point Loma Nazarene study um, that Dr. Dr. Reeser put out a couple years ago that basically said that um, it's about 13 years from conception to, to uh, occupancy for housing development. So you think about that, and if you have an, an eight or 10 year old child right now, and there's a development that's going in on the corner, if you don't support that development, your kid will not have a place to live. Because if you, but if you support that development, by the time it gets built and someone can move in, your kid's gonna pretty much be graduating from college. Wow. 13 years, that's how long it takes and you don't want to wait till they graduate, which is why you see more people living with their family and more extended families living together, which don't get me wrong, um, I support all types of housing, the association sure. supports um, I think extended families living together is a great thing. You see it in lots of places around the world. Um, we in general need to be more proactive about uh, providing all types of housing and even new types we haven't even thought of um, that uh, we can do. Um, I mean, it's, it's interesting because the the housing issue really comes down to a lack of housing and they kind of pin it on the rental owners that it's their problem but at the end of the day when i talk to owners they're just trying to provide nice clean safe livable housing to their I, tenants. I think that's like the second thing that comes to mind you know when they bring up the price controls and the rent, rent control and those sort of things I think the second thing that comes to mind is, A, this is unfair. It, you know, why are we having to be capped? Even in 
um, natural disasters and price gouging and thing, there's other industries that the prices still go up. Right. And we all see it and know it. Um, I can tell you one that happens twice a year, every year, like, like, like clockwork. But you know, the second thing that comes up is that we want more housing. We want to provide housing. These are people who want to solve the problem, create a solution and solve the problem. And they're not able to do that. And yet they're the ones that the burden is being pushed off onto. Right. It's somehow because we're in the housing industry right now that we're responsible for all housing from now to eternity and, and whatnot. And that's not the case. Um, it's a regional issue. It's a regional crisis. And, and honestly, it's not even a regional crisis. The housing situation we are experiencing right now is statewide. It's nationwide. It's international. I've, we've, we've talked to partners in Toronto. Oh, we're seeing it in Germany. We're seeing it in, in England. You're seeing it in Ireland. You're seeing it in multiple places. Um, it is a world issue. We aren't building enough housing uh, to keep pace with the uh, population growth. It's a big social issue. It's not going to be fixed or solved in three years. And you know that's what that's one of the reasons I like being in this business. And you know my wife's also in this business. Is at the end of the day we're we're trying to do good, provide housing. And that's what I like about the association. All the members that I meet when I come to the events, they're all just good people trying to provide housing, but also you know trying to also run a business off of it. Uh, what would you say the number one? I mean, maybe we'll just trans. Uh, will shift into the association itself because you know I'm a big fan yeah. and those that are watching this they may not be members and I always encourage every owner I talk to uh, to join primarily because of all the things you just said the lobbying the the fighting for the rights of the rental owners but what other uh, service does the association provide its members that you think it's something that people should know about yeah, well, I'm a big fan of the association too. <laughs> yeah. Not only do I get to work here, but honestly, it's one of the reasons I've worked for as long as I have is that um, I love our members. Um, they love what they do. They, they tend to always ask the question first, what's the problem? How do we solve it? It's, um, they, they are solution-oriented people. And I think it just comes with the nature of managing communities. Sure. As you always have some situation you have to resolve. So they look at uh, even the legislative items and said, the first question is, what's the problem? Let's talk about how we can fix this. Um, and let, you know, and that it goes even before you get to legislation, because sometimes, most of the time, a lot of these things are just communication. Um, what we encourage our members to to um, to do is, you know, you're part of the community. Your housing is part of a community. Be part of the community. Engage yourself in the community. It's our community. It's what we make of it. And um, and that's carried us a long ways. The association, you know, we we're born out of advocacy. Uh, we were born 100 years ago because of a legislative issue that didn't impact our industry. So uh, the group of owners came together and said, we want to create an association that can be advocates for our, for our industry, if you will. And it's been that way ever since. So we, in a nutshell, we advocate and we educate. And we educate so we don't have to advocate. And hmm. um, what that means is that we do a lot of teaching to make sure that owners know what the laws are, and that can be daunting because like the laws literally change every day, um, in in depending on what part of it it is. You have the legislative part, you have the regulatory part, you have court jurisdictions that are that are being decided. All those things play a factor into the operations of um, of a rental community, and um, so the education is a very key component. Um, I think on average we probably teach 50, 60 classes a year of some some sort to keep our owners aware of what's going on. Um, and again, it's, it's the person that's not informed that does something wrong that's gonna create new legislation. So first of all, join the association to get the education. Um, we prov um, I think one of the key aspects, the most popular one with the independent owners is the fact that we provide uh, unlimited free operational advice. So if, um, if, you've, if you haven't rented your unit in a long time and uh, you haven't looked at your rental criteria, you can call us up and we can walk you through the latest trends in rental criteria and help you update that information before you go out and start looking for a, a new tenant. The up-to-date forms. Um, nowadays in California, if your form is not completely up-to-date and legal, you will lose, uh, you could lose a case just on that. Your forms are not up-to-date, sorry, you're dismissed, bring it back when they are. Um, so there's all those sort of things that we look out for on a regular basis um, that we work hard to do. The operational advice is probably, again, the, probably the most key, crucial one um, because particularly with the small owners, you'll rent a place out, you, you'll, you've had a tenant for two or three years, 
suddenly they moved out and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know, I don't know what the rules are anymore. I, sure. You can call us and we can walk you through all of it. Yeah. It's part of your membership. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it seems like the more you guys do for the owners, the better it is for the communities. We like to think that. I mean, we've taught we've taught renting uh, 101 courses in high schools, yeah. where we help prepare high school students for moving out of their parents' house and and, and renting. We're working on a program right now with one local uh, uh, educational institution, if you will, to try and create a training program to get um, high schools uh, that aren't, aren't college bound into tech fields. Uh, one of the things that most people don't realize is uh, the industry is starving for maintenance technicians, people who maintain the properties. Um, uh, someone with some basic skills, uh, we can get them trained up and they can walk into positions making 40, 50, 60,000 a year. And uh, that's on tech degrees. And that's yeah. a nationwide crisis right now. Everybody in the nation's facing that. Multiple sister organizations around the state, around the country are doing the same sort of training programs. And the beauty of our industry is it's portable. There are rentals everywhere. That's true. So we're actually very, uh, we, actually, uh, we actually work very well with the military, um, military spouses. Um, husband or wife's in the military, they're getting transferred around. The spouse can get a job in our industry and transfer with them. Um, we have uh, uh, some of our big corporate owners have properties in most, most every state, um, including Hawaii. We've had, we've had one folks uh, from members of ours who went from here to Hawaii and then back to Phoenix, um, and all in the management industry. And um, so it's a good portable career as well. As well. Um, so it's a good opportunity. The industry does a lot for the community. Um, we do a lot of give back. Uh, we su um, we've supported numerous charities in the uh, in the past um, in multiple ways, and and our and that's not even to go into what our owners have done. Um, they are tend to be very quiet about those things and where they give their contributions and stuff. But I can tell you that there are a few very large institutions that if you start looking at the names on them, they're all a part of this association at one point. Yeah, it makes sense. It's it it's been easy for me to, to jump into this association, be a part of it. Before I ask my final question, as we get ready to cut off here, what's the best way for someone that wants to contact the association or get updates on sure. the re legislation to contact the association? Sure, um, in the modern world, uh, www.socalrha.org, S-O-C-A-L-R-H-A.org. That's our new website under the new branded name. You can call us at 858-278-8070, and uh, one of our staff members will walk you through everything. And I believe on the website as well, you can um, sign up for our newsletter and start receiving our information from our newsletter. Perfect. We'll put all that down in the description uh, down below, as this will be a video. And then my final question is, I mean, we kind of already covered it, but I, I wanted to ask it. The new branding, uh, all of the... the uh, hot topics that are going on. What is, what is the, the apartment association, the Southern California Rental Housing Association, this association, what are you trying to be for your members? Um, they're one-stop shop. This is the place they go to get the information. We are the voice for the rental housing industry. Um, we've been saying that for years. We're their voice in City Hall, at the state capitol, at the legislature, with, regulator, with regulators. Uh, most people don't think about the regulations. Um, regulations is a whole other beast. Um, we're the place to get the latest information and the correct information. That's why we provide the rental forms. That's why we provide a screening service um, to help you screen your tenants. That's why we have insurance products to help you in, insure uh, your, your, um, your properties and in there in, um, you name it. We have so many resources that we want to be the one-stop shop. Uh, that way you, you know where to go to get what you need. We're right here. And we've been here for 99 point like 11 years now. 99.11, <laughs> yes. One, one more month and it'll one be 100. Yeah. Wow. That means that uh, staying power is, it means that it, it works. It works. And, and you yeah. guys are doing a good job. If you're not a member of the Southern California Rental Housing Association and you own any type of rental properties from condos to single family to apartments, seriously, you need to consider joining. I, I tell this to every owner I talk to. Uh, it's important for the industry it's important for your business and the good thing is we have guys like alan pentico here as the executive director who have the experience to manage us through these challenging legislative times yeah and i'll just end by saying doug you know i think um the thing is you know it's a tough situation well uh, we've really been put put in a spot where a lot of people want to 
um, blame landlords for everything and they, we make easy targets. But the reality is, you know, the common question I get is, you know, about the laws. There aren't laws for tenants and laws for landlords. They're just laws. And it's just on what side of the fence and how you interpret them. Um, landlords are in the business to provide housing. That's what we do. We want to provide housing. And most people I talk to these days are, um, they're, um, they're glad that the tenants are showing up to these discussions because eventually, hopefully, we'll be able to, the tenants and the landlords will be, get, get, be able to get together on the same page and start putting um, effort into getting more housing built and, stop, and break those log jams, if you will, because we want to provide the housing and they need it. And um, we, you know, unfortunately, tend to be the scapegoats. It, it's a huge social issue. And yeah, it, I talk to a lot, I observe a lot. My my wife is in the business and on the on the operation side, it's not an easy business. You're in charge, you're responsible for many, many thousands of people, thousands of families. Yeah. And they are kind of the unsung heroes that nobody yeah. talks about. You hear about a few bad ones, there's a few bad apples, or you hear about one situation that was that maybe spiraled out of control, but every day in San Diego and across the country, uh, owners are ensuring that people have a roof over their heads. We're the least expensive form of housing outside of government subsidized, but actually I think we're least even more or we're even less expensive than them because I think it costs about 20% more to build a government site, government subsidized unit nowadays. Yeah, I was going to say, well, yeah. there were some government <laughs> subsidized units that have been built recently and they weren't the least expensive no. units in our business. We were like, wow. 500,000 a door. Oh, I heard 750 this morning in San Francisco <laughs> for government subsidized. I was like, wow. It's a, it's a tough social issue, and I'm just thankful that the association's here to help with it. So, Alan, thanks for your time. Thank you for being a member. Uh, it's my pleasure. Appreciate it. Yep.